Hi everyone, in this video we are going to be looking at section 16.6, .6, surface integrals. Um, a surface integral, to kind of explain it briefly, um, would be used if, let's say, you have a sphere that has uh, you know, a different, a, a varied temperature distribution. Uh, so the example that, I'll, that we'll use is it's cold near the poles and warm near the equator, much like the Earth. How would you find the average temperature over the entire sphere? So that's something that is done uh, on Earth, right? Uh, the, the average temperature is compared one year to the next, and oddly enough, it's rising, right? That's, that's a thing that's actually computed. Uh, do they use calculus to compute that? I'm not 100% sure, but if you wanted to do that with certainty um, over an entire sphere, you would use calculus. You would use integration by adding up the temperature value at very small regions on that sphere. That's where the integral comes in. The table here on the slide we have curves and we have surfaces and when we've got a curve we can compute the arc length or on a surface we can compute the surface area. Uh, on curves we compute line integrals, on surfaces we compute surface integrals. So those are just the, the, the parallel topics that we look at. The first step in building toward these surface integrals is looking at parametrized surfaces. Now, normally when we've written a parametric description for a curve, r of t, right, that has, uh, you know, some function x of t and y of t uh, for t in some interval from a to b, right? So we have, uh, we have two dependent functions, one parameter, and that gives us an x and a y component, or if we're in three dimensions, an x, a y, and a z component. But we need one parameter and two or three functions, depending on whether we're in R2 or R3, to describe a curve in space. To de describe a surface in space, well, we need a little bit more. If, I, if we're in three dimensions here, we have two uh, two parameters, u and v, and x, y, and z are functions of u and v. Okay, so one parameter gets us a curve in space, two parameters, u and v, give us a surface in space. And so we've got the first uh, most basic example here is a rectangle in the uv plane mapping to a surface in the x, y, z three-dimensional space. And so we have points in the UV plane, points in the UV plane, take a point here, take a point here, take a point here, and that puts it in, you know, some point in three-dimensional space. Okay, so we need U and V to generate a, a surface in space. And if you think about it, hopefully it makes a little bit of sense. If I only have one parameter, T, that's just thinking, uh, you know, I've got points on a line and I am moving them to some x, y, and z component in space. But now when we have two parameters, u and v, we're moving them, uh, those, those x, comma, y, or u, comma, v coordinates to some point in three-dimensional space. So it kind of it might make sense there. The second parameterized surface that we'll look at takes a rectangle in the UV plane, and if I apply my R of UV function, A cosine U, A sine U, comma V, we generate a cylinder in the XYZ space. Okay, so our, our U axis goes from 0 to 2 pi, so as we move horizontally along the U axis, that generates circles in the XYZ plane, or uh, space. And then, you know, moving vertically up from 0 to h, that gets us from 0 to h on the z-axis. And then the, the coefficient here of a cosine u and a sine u, that's the radius of our cylinder. Then to generate a cone in the xyz space, we take our rectangle 0 to 2 pi on the u-axis, 0 to h on the v-axis, and apply this a v over h cosine u, a v over si h sine u, comma v, uh, to, to, to generate a cone in, instead of a, a sphere. So that changing the, the coefficient there, a v over h, is what, gener is what takes the, the cylinder and gives us a cone in instead. The last surface that we'll look at is a sphere, and a sphere comes 
from a rectangle, oddly enough, in the UV plane. And if we apply this parametric uh, function to points in the UV plane, we generate a sphere. And that, that description comes from, well, actually, our, the section that we looked at on spherical coordinates, that uh, set of points, rho, comma, uh, phi, comma, theta, uh, such that rho is equal to A, or the radius of the sphere, and phi is between 0 and pi, and theta is between 0 and 2 pi. Right, we looked at that previously, uh, and our, our, a couple of formulas that came up, not a ton in the section, but a little bit, was that to convert between rectangular and polar, we have our x coordinate in rectangular was a sine phi cos theta, and then y, the y coordinate was a sine phi sine theta, and then the z coordinate was a cos theta. So that, that work that we did in the last section is, is where this parametric uh, description of a sphere comes from. Okay, so now let's look at two examples where we are given a, a, a surface in the XYZ uh, space, and we want to convert that to a parametric description. So first we're given a plane, 3x minus 2y plus z equals 2. And the steps that you take to, to convert this to a parametric function are, well, what we're going to do is we're going to take and solve this uh, plane and get z by itself. And I could perform equivalent steps of, of getting x or y by itself, whichever is most convenient. My z coefficient is 1, so in this case it's most efficient to solve for z. So z would equal 2 minus 3x plus 2y. And then we can say, okay, we're going to let x equal u, we're going to let y equal v, and then if x is equal to u and y is equal to v, well, then z is equal to 2 minus 3u plus 2v. And there I have my parametric description, right? I have two parameters and each component defined. So now my r function, r of u and v, is equal to the vector the vector valued function u comma v comma 2 minus 3 u plus 2 v and that's it for that one in b we have a paraboloid z equals x squared plus y squared and uh, one thing that we one approach we can take because this uh, surface is round is we can think in terms of polar coordinates and so what I'm going to start out with is I'm going to say we're going to let u equal theta, so u is going to be the degree measure, and we're going to let v equal z. Uh, it, it would technically be more convenient, because I know where this problem is going, to let v equal the square root of z, but that's not, you could kind of go either way, and you'll hopefully see as we go through this why that might make sense. So now if I, let, if I have that v is equal to z, then we can make a substitution and say, well, x squared plus y squared is equal to v. So that tells me that I have a circle of radius, not v, but radius square root of v. And so for my parametric, and that's really all the information that I need now to write this parametric description is that we have, uh, let me write that down, circle radius radical v, right? That's what I get from that equation. So when we write our r of u comma v, well, we can say for our vector function that we've got the x component is radical v cosine u. The y component is radical v sine u. And the z component is, well, as I said from the beginning, v is equal to z, so it would be just v. And then we'll also define an, define an interval here. So our u bounds would be, well, u is theta, so from 0 to 2 pi. And then our v bounds are, well, since v was equal to z, v would be from 0 to 9. Um, and the way you can kind of think about that, and again, why it might make sense, right? u is 0 to 2 pi, so that's what gives us the round uh, the circles uh, as we move up our paraboloid from 0 to 9. And as we move up from 0 to 9, 
that v, the, the radical v coefficient there increases, so the radius increases as we move vertically up the z-axis from 0 to 9. So we have larger circles generating the paraboloid. And in the last, in the last one, I didn't specify um, our interval for that one, our u and v, u and v interval, u would be from negative infinity to positive infinity because we were given no, no uh, limitations on our plane, so it's just a plane, and then v, similarly, is from negative infinity to positive infinity. Now we move on to surface integrals of scalar valued functions, and I'll just kind of talk briefly about wh how, where the, the formula comes from. Uh, so we've got our, our, our surface in the UV plane, so this rectangle in the UV plane, and we're slicing that up into very small uh, cross sections or uh, very small areas. So this, the area of this piece right here, well that would map on the parameterization to that area in the XYZ space and we want to know what the area of that small rectangle is on our surface and the way that we kind of think about that are you know the, the the way that we think about that area is well that I really what I need to know is how long is a a vector in this direction and it, where is it pointing and how long is a vector in this whoops in this direction and where is it pointing? And the way that we kind of think about that is to look at the unit tangent vectors. So that the that t sub u and t sub v are the unit tangent vectors in the u direction and in the v direction. And that's kind of where, ultimately, when we get to the formula, that's kind of where uh, a big part of it comes from. And as it says here on the slide, in our case patch, the, the parallelogram, or I called it a rectangle before, but it's really a parallelogram. The parallelogram has this area T sub U delta U cross T sub V delta V. Uh, so we're going to ultimately be computing a cross product of a couple of tangent vectors. So that's like the one thing where you that I just wanted to show where it comes from in the formula. So here on this slide, we've got the definition for our surface integral of scalar valued functions. I'm not going to read it for you. I'm just going to underline the highlights. Uh, we've got t sub u cross t sub v, the magnitude of that cross product. Kind of talked about where that came from briefly on the last slide. And we, we've, that's going to be kind of the first thing that we look at is these unit tangent vectors and finding their cross product by taking uh, some partial derivatives. So t sub u is the partial derivative of r with respect to u, okay? And t sub v is the partial derivative of r with respect to v. And so in taking and computing those, those uh, tangent vectors and then finding their cross product, that is, uh, from the last slide, that is what we're, what we're finding, the area of those small patches, those small parallelograms on our surface. And then the, the rest in there is kind of what you would expect. We have the double integral over our region of the function that you are integrating, and then times the cross product, t sub u cross t sub v, d a uh, and it could be the case where your function that you're integrating is equal to one but otherwise you're going to be substituting in your pr parametric uh, description that came from your your r function back at the beginning of the problem or at the beginning of the theorem in this case you'll be plugging that into the function that you are integrating so that function could be the 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 temperature of your sphere of the earth as, as a function of uh, x, y, and z, but then you would need to write it in terms of your variables u and v. Okay, so that's the big, the big formula from this section. Okay, now let's look at an example where we actually compute a surface integral. In this first example, we're going to find the surface area of a cylinder of radius a that is positive and has a height of h. If you recall from some math class previous to this one, your surface area formula for a cylinder is 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r h. The 2 pi r squared, we're not going to have in this problem because that represents the top and bottom of the cylinder. Our, pair, our description of a cylinder is just going to be the outer, the outside of the cylinder. So that we should end up with 2 pi r h as our answer. 
but uh, our radius is a, so it'll be 2 pi a h. That's what we would expect to get as a result. We're, so we're kind of showing another, oh, another way to show where this formula comes from. All right, so the first step now that we'll actually take is to write down our parametric description for a cylinder. Our vector value function r of u v is equal to a cosine u, comma a sine u, comma v. And then we can compute our uh, our tangent vectors, t sub u, t, t sub v, and then find their cross product. And that is the the cross product of the tangent vectors is is, is defined as the normal vector. So we're going to say that n, which is equal to t sub u cross t sub v. Now, I could write each of those individual tangent vectors um, separately, uh, but what is, I guess, uh, most efficient use of our time and writing is to substitute them right into the cross product matrix that we've been using, um, well, almost since the beginning, of the beginning of the semester. So the row one is i, j, and k. Row two of the matrix is the t sub u. So we're going to go back and look at our, our vector function r and take the partial derivative of each component with respect to u. So the first component gives us negative a sine u. The second component, and clearly I didn't leave myself enough space, so I'll be correcting that, is a cosine u. And the third component is 0 because the derivative of v with respect to u is 0. There we go. So I've made myself more space now. All right. And then the t sub v are partial derivatives of r with respect to v. This component is 0. This component is 0. This component is 1. 0, 0, 1. Now, you can feel free to pause the video and compute that cross product by hand. Um, I'm going to write down the result, uh, but what you would get is a cosine u, a sine u, comma, zero. Okay, so you can verify that, but that's what you would, uh, that's what you would end up with for that cross product. Now, my next step, I'm going to compute the magnitude of that cross product. And if you do that, you get A, just A. Okay, and it should hopefully make sense. The square root of A cosine squared plus A sine squared plus 0. Cosine squared and sine squared gives us 1. So all we have is the square root of A squared, which is A. Now that we have that preliminary work out of the way, we can compute our surface area, our surface integral. Okay, so we start this out as the double integral over our surface S of 1 ds, because we're finding a surface area, our, our function, that f of x, y, z, uh, is, is just 1. And that is equal to the double integral, so applying the theorem now, over the region r of the magnitude of that cross product that we computed in the first step. That's a v. d a. Now, substituting in what we know about our region r first, we have the integral from 0 to 2 pi because uh, it's a circle, the full circle of radius a. If you recall from earlier in the section where we set u equal to the angle theta and v equal to the uh, v was equal to the, the, the z, the, the height along the z axis. So in our case, v is equal to h. So our v bounds are from 0 to h. And then our function, again, is 1 times the cross product, the magnitude of the cross product, which is a dv du. If you evaluate and go through the steps, uh, or integrate and go through the steps of this double integral, what you end up with is 2 pi a h. And feel free to go through them. Um, I'm gonna, I'm not going to right now, but um, that's that's what you get. You're integrating a constant with respect to v, so you get a times v, and then that's still a constant with respect to u. Okay, so so you should get two pi a h, which going back to the beginning is what we expected. 
moving down here just to look at the picture um just that that just kind of gives you an, a, a a visual of of what we're looking at in this example it doesn't really help with the show anything about the double integral that we computed but gives you all the other uh, information here so in this next example we're going to find the surface area of a partial cylinder and our region is the set of points r theta such that r is equal to 4 so our cylinder has a radius of 4 theta is between 0 and 2 pi and on the z-axis we're between z equals 0 and z equals 16 minus 2x now we will define our vector function r of uv is equal to 4 cosine u 4 sine u comma v so it's pretty much the exact same as in the last example so now we have a precise uh, radius of 4 instead of the general one from the last example uh, in this case our u bounds are from 0 to 2 pi again similar to the last example but our v bounds are a little bit different we start at v equals 0 because of z equals 0 and we go up to v equals 16 minus 2 x because again that is what our z bounds were However, I can't have u's and v's and x's in the same problem. So let me erase my x and write what that should be in terms of u's and v's. Well, just like x is our cos theta, in this example, x is our cos u, or 4 cosine u. Okay, so we've still got to have you know just u's and v's when in, when we make this uh, when we set up this integral. Now I'm going to go ahead and set up my double integral, so my surface integral here, uh, and I'll explain why I'm going to jump to that right now without doing the preliminary work. So we have the double integral over our surface s of one ds because again we're finding a surface area, so our function is one is equal to the double integral over our region r of the magnitude t sub u cross t sub v da now i submit that i already know what the magnitude of that cross product is because we just did the previous example so hopefully you can see why it would be four that cro the, the magnitude of that cross product okay so i'm just going to substitute four right in and and also our, our bounds for the integral so we have the integral from zero to two pi the integral from 0 to 16 minus 8 cosine u of 4 dv du. When we do this integration, there's part of my picture. When we do this integration, uh, we're going to have 4v evaluated at the top and bottom bounds. So that would be 4 times 16 minus 8 cosine u d u and then we integrate with respect to u so 16 u minus 8 sine u substitute in my bounds and what that results in is 128 pi as the answer uh, to that double integral or the surface area of our region r okay and if you look at the picture here we've got our, our cylinder with radius 4 z equals 0 is the bottom of the cylinder z equals 16 minus 2x so is the slice sliced top of the cylinder and 128 pi that is the area of we, what we have on the outside of the cylinder it does not include this slanty face but it does include everything around the outside of our cylinder and also it does not include the bottom of the cylinder okay so we're thinking it's open on the top and bottom now the next theorem that we are going to look at involves uh, surface integrals over uh, explicitly defined surfaces. And what that means is that instead of uh, you know, my surface being a cylinder that is not explicitly defined but, but best defined parametrically, uh, explicitly defined means if I have z equal to some function of x's and y's. Now we certainly still can parameterize that and we did back at the beginning of the section, the first uh, slide on parametric uh, surfaces. But 
in doing that, it, it results in a fairly straightforward formula allowing you to skip some of the steps. So if I have z equal to f of x, y, we can define the parameters. I wrote this down. We can set u equal to x, v equal to y, and then z would be whatever the function of u's and v's is. That's perfectly fine. And then compute the, the cross product in the exact same way. However, interesting stuff happens when you do that. If you can, you can show pretty quickly that our t sub u is equal to uh, 1 comma 0 comma uh, z sub x, the partial derivative of z with respect to x. And you could also show that t sub v is equal to 0, 1 zy. Pause the video here and think about why that might be the case. Okay, But then if you compute the cross product, tu cross tv, you get this vector negative z sub x, negative z y, and then the, the third component is 1. Okay, so it, 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 we can kind of forego some of the steps. We can skip some of the steps. And then uh, the magnitude of that cross product is equal to the square root of z sub x squared plus z sub y squared plus 1. Now, let me be clear. You can use the previous method, and that's perfectly fine. This is just offering a different approach when you have a surface that is explicitly defined. If you don't like this approach, just focus on the other one. Perfectly reasonable. Okay, But this theorem 1612 says that if we do have our explicitly defined surface, uh, instead of the formula having that magnitude of the cross product, what we have is, that was terrible underlining, what we have is this uh, substitution into the formula of the square root of zx squared plus zy squared plus 1. Okay, Again, it, it, it makes it just a slightly different formula, shortens the process maybe a little bit, but it's one more thing to remember that you don't necessarily have to, I'm not going to force you to do it this way, although the homework does, I think, tell you to do it one way or another, but I'm telling you, you can kind of use the other approach, the, other, the, the method that we've already done in the first two examples, if you would prefer. In our next example, we're going to find the area of a region S that lies in the plane Z equals 12 minus 4X minus 3Y, directly above the region R, bounded by the ellipse x squared over 4 plus y squared over or plus y squared equals 1. Now I'm going to rewrite my z function and think about why that is explicitly defined, right? It says z equals. So here's a case where I could parameterize this by letting u equal to x, v equal to y, and rewriting z would be 12 minus 4x or 4u minus 3v. Perfectly fine. And then we go about the problem the same way we did the first two. Or we can apply this theorem that says that our uh, we can compute the square root of z sub x squared plus z sub y squared plus 1 and substitute that as the cross product into our double integral. And if you do compute that, uh, your partial derivative of z with respect to x is negative 4 squared plus partial derivative of z with respect to y is negative 3 squared plus 1. Uh, simplifying that gives us the square root of 26, which again, I submit that if you do parameterize this and compute the cross product and subsequently the magnitude, you will also get radical 26. So then we can take and, and compute the double integral of our service, surface of 1 ds is equal to the double integral over our region r of radical 26 da. And that's as, actually as much uh, work as I'm going to do in this one um, to actually uh, evaluate this double integral because we're above an ellipse and not a circle. It would just be a little bit more involved than I necessarily want to get into right now to do this, this integration. Um, so I'm just going to skip 
23 steps <laughs> and say that the answer is 2 pi radical 26. The purpose of the example, though, was to focus on how the explicitly defined function can uh, save us some work, save us some steps in setting up our double integral. All right, I want to look uh, briefly at one more example that's kind of already done for us. This example you can also find in your text. Um, and in, in this one, we're, we're finding an average temperature. So we're looking at an application of what this process kind of allows us to do. So in this application problem, we're given a temperature function for a sphere. And it's a variable temperature, t of uh, phi comma theta is 10 plus 50 sine phi. So the temperature varies depending on where you are, your phi and your theta angle on this sphere. And our phi bounds are from 0 to pi, theta bounds 0 to 2 pi. We're clearly in spherical coordinates. Uh, the temperature is 10 degrees at the poles, increasing to 60 degrees at the equator. That's what that 10 plus 50 sine phi uh, does, starting at 10, increasing to 50 degrees as your phi angle changes. So we're going to find the average temperature over this sphere. So to parameterize, we set u equal to phi, v equal to theta, and then our temperature function now becomes 10 plus 50 sine u. So we just rewrote our function in terms of u. So let me draw that. We rewrote our function in terms of u. That's not the parametric description, that's just the function. Um, and then where this example kind of skips a little bit of the work, it says integrating the temperature function over the sphere and using the fact that this cross product or the magnitude of the cross product equals a squared sine u. Okay. In order to show where a squared sine u comes from, we would need to go back to our parametric description of a sphere, which was rather lengthy and chunky, uh, and, and take the partial derivative with respect to u, the partial derivative with respect to v, uh, phi, or excuse me, v, and then compute the cross product and then compute the magnitude. So like that part would be a little bit lengthy to show and I think that's kind of why they skip it. I think um, at the end of the section there's actually a table that gives you a whole bunch of uh, parametric descriptions as well as the the normal vector and, and then the which is the cross product allowing you to save some time with uh, a few homework problems. So now we take our surface integral of our function and we've got our u substituted in already is equal to the double integral over our region of again the function and then the cross product equals that a squared sine u dv du 0 to pi 0 to 2 pi for the row coming from originally the row and phi bounds then you can go through the integration again if you want to do this on your own feel free to i'm just kind of giving you the overview of this problem and how it works out we integrate first with respect to v, v substitute in the bounds then with respect to u substitute in the bounds uh like it says evaluate the outer and inner integral outer integral and doesn't really show any of the work it, that's why we're taking this like surface level view of the problem and we get 10 pi a squared over 4 plus 5 pi. And what that represents is the total area, or the, the total temperature over the whole sphere of radius a. That's the total temperature. So to then find the average temperature, we take that 10 pi a squared times 4 plus 5 pi and divide by the surface area of a sphere, 4 pi a squared giving us an average temperature of approximately 49.3 degrees. Okay, uh, and, and it says notice that the equatorial region, uh, that's pretty close to the 50 degrees and not very close to the 10 degrees that's at the poles. And if you think about it, that's because how much of the surface area exists up at the 10 degree uh, portion of the sphere, not much. How much of the surface area is around the equator at the, around the 60 degree region, uh, well, that's where most of it is. That's why the temperature is weighted so heavily toward the 60 degrees. Okay, so that's the power of this of this surface integral and what we can do with it uh, in terms of application problems. That is also the end of this section. There's a little bit more dealing with uh, vector fields that we do not cover. So please uh, feel free to, like, if you're looking at the text at all, don't go any further in the section than what we've looked at thus far. Thank you for listening, and I will see you in class.